Hospice really gave a quality of life. It's not something that we should be afraid to talk about. Here's the gap. Hi, my name is Jose. I'm the executive director for Barantes Hospice, and I'm, I'm really honored to be joined here by Dr. April Aloya. She's a DNP, which means a doctor in nursing practice. She's been a hospice nurse for nine years, and she has been a DNP for hospice for two years. Hi, Jose. I'm very happy to be here today as well with you. Thank you for having me. We are actually happy for you to agree to join us. So uh, I wanted to start by asking you, so how did you get into nursing? Well, you know, the first time I was in college, I actually knew that I wanted to go into medicine. But nursing at that point, it was in the early 90s and nursing was in a different place. And in many ways, they were still not as evolved as they are now. And I didn't think it was really the profession for me. So I thought medicine, like studying actually to become an MD would be the only road for me. And because my husband and I had started our family very young, we already had a one-year-old, I knew that I really needed to just put that on hold and continue with, with my current plan of study. But I, I always knew that I would get back to medicine somehow. And then as years went on and nursing evolved, I paid attention. And when it came time for me to go back to school, nursing was very much the discipline for me. And I always began studying nursing with the idea that I would become a doctor of nursing practice. However, I was very happy to know that I would have to stop as a BSN and work as an RN because I think that is fundamental in the type of nurse practitioner you can become. So I, you know, stopped as an RN and worked for four years before starting my DNP studies. Well, that, that's interesting. And also it's very admirable because I mean, having a baby and all that, I mean, it, it must have been uh, kind of hard to, to juggle all that together, you know, with school and work and... Well, that, that is true, but I think something that happens to a lot of parents is children make you want to be, you know, better and you want to set an example for them. So you reach down and you become the best of, of who you can be, I think. And my children definitely had that effect on me. Yeah, that, that's, that's very true. So, so tell me, how did you get into hospice? Why did you choose that field? When I was about 25, my nephew, he died of a rare brain cancer. And several months leading up to his death, he was on hospice. And I mean, hospice really gave him and my sister and her family a quality of life that he had had not for months because maybe even actually I have to say years really um, due to the cancer treatment and the idea that um, an organization and nurses individual nurses can make such a difference to uh, a patient and a family's quality of life it, it really moved me deeply and I never you know it, it stays with me and I actually emulate that whole idea within my practice because I think that's really what nursing is. We're there to enhance the quality of the patient's life and we need to balance you know that curative treatment even not in hospice. I, I think we need to look at that a little more closely in medicine. It's funny you, you say that you know about how uh, we have to uh, kind of enhance the quality of life in, in, in all of the medical field. I think now in a lot of the hospitals are implementing you know palliative care in the hospitals and they have their palliative care team so i'm, I'm really glad that you know uh, that palliative care and, ho and hospice have been utilized more often now absolutely we are we are getting there it's um i'd like to see us getting there faster of course i'm impatient because i see where we where we are and where we're going and i know that there's a great need for palliative care yeah well, well, since you have seen the, the good things that, that we can do, you know, in hospice, what are some of the things that, that we miss the mark on? What are, what are some things we can do better? The whole subject matter of dying is something that's very difficult for society at large to discuss, to think about, to... There's a taboo. It's like people feel that it'll make everybody sad or it's a real downer to discuss it. So I think those of us, you know, that can really help educate those that don't understand and try and find a comfort level in speaking about this because I, I you know it's the universal thing that all humans will do we all come to this earth we live and we will all die and so it's not something that we should be afraid to talk about we should try and get comfortable with it within ourselves so that we can discuss it and we can make it I mean of course it's going to be sad but it can be poignant it can be beautiful and that, that requires planning. That's not gonna just happen spontaneously. 
So we have to get better about talking about it and about looking at how we feel about it ourselves because if we're not comfortable, there's no way we're gonna be able to help really educate that family and bring them to a place where they can embrace it. That's very true. What you said is very important. You know, we, we have to do a lot of education. You know, we have to be very open. We have to be very honest and talk truthfully with the families while at the same time be, being very tactful on how to put it. Yes, and, uh, compassionate and meeting them. So I think that's one of the things that happens. And because, you know, we have to meet the patients and their families where they are. And I do definitely respect that um, because you'll, it'll just fall on deaf ears if you're just, you know, missing them all together or they just shut down because it's too much for them to hear. But we have to meet them and then there's a few areas that we have to push them just a little bit. And I'm not talking about even a foot. Maybe some families can only be pushed a couple centimeters, but you start in that direction and you keep doing it. You know what I'm saying? And I think that is an area that we can really improve on because I hear other professionals who are good, good, hospice professionals say things like oh well you know this family doesn't want to hear that and this family's not ready for that and it's like yes i i'm sure that's accurate but we we need to help them get ready for it by just asking them to stretch a little bit but doing it every time so one of the questions that uh, that i get asked a lot and, and i wanted to ask you dr april so what are areas of the dying process that you find to produce the most anxiety in patients and families? I think that when patients can no longer speak for themselves and very often at that time, you know, it falls to a surrogate decision maker who is usually a loved one, a child, a spouse, and you would be shocked by how many families have never had this discussion. Things about when to medicate me if I look like I'm uncomfortable. If I am not sleeping well, when to medicate me. If I'm coughing all the time when I'm being fed, when to continue feeding me and when not. So these very difficult choices fall to the decision makers and that is really tough when they're second guessing their patient's desires. So how can we prepare our patients and our families better? We can have frank discussions specifically about the areas that we know are going to affect all patients regardless of the disease process. Like things I mentioned, dysphagia where they lose the inability to swallow, pain and anxiety, what levels to medicate at, and then document these conversations between the patient while they can still speak and their surrogate decision maker. And then we have these on file so that when the time comes and the patient can no longer speak for themselves, we have record of what the patient wants and it takes the burden off the surrogate decision maker. So Dr. April, do you think the hospice benefit brings enough support at this stage of the disease process? I think overall hospice does a good job in taking care of all the patients need with the interdisciplinary team approach. There's a spiritual counselor assigned to the patient, there's a medical social worker, there's a shower aid, of course there's nursing, there's an attending physician, all the equipment is covered and medications related to the hospice diagnosis. So I think that is, you know, very supportive. However, it's when the other things, essentials like food and bed sheets are very difficult for families because this is a time of crisis and many may have to quit their job to become full-time caregivers for the patient. So some hospices have foundations set up and that's a wonderful way to balance that need because there is funding there and a way for patients to get what they need. But not all hospices have that and that's where there's a gap and we should all look to that and to think about what, what we can do to try and close that gap and don't let those families fall in it. But what type of myths exist around the hospice benefit? I think the most prevailing myth is the one that we should discuss, which is that hospice is for the last week of life or, you know, even maybe the last month because, I mean, we are getting better. When I first started in hospice nine years ago, I, it really was like the last week. And like I said, it has gotten a little bit better, but people really think this. They have this idea that it's for the very, very end and it's truly not. It's for end stage disease processes when patients no longer want aggressive curative treatment. And so we have a team approach and it can be so beneficial for the family and patient and the quality of life. So I, I think we need to do a better job about educating that hospice is not just for the last week or the last month of life. So kind of touching on that, how can we debunk some of these myths? I think it can start with 
really people who work in hospice and through a grassroots effort, if you will, if you know all of us that work in hospice commit to educating our families, our neighbors, our communities at large about hospice, about what the benefit offers and when it should be elected. I think that that would do a world of good. And uh, so do you think the, uh, the medical field understands hospice? And if not, what would you like to clarify to the medical community? So I think that we're getting better, but no, I think that the, at large, the medical community still thinks what the public thinks, that hospice is for the last month of life. And that's not the decision for the medical provider. That's not, we need, as medical providers, we need to be educating our patients and allowing them to make their choices. We need to stop the idea that it's up to us when a patient is appropriate for hospice. It's up for the patient. But if the patient doesn't know about it, if they've not been educated, then they can't opt. So we need to educate doctors more, and it's getting better. We need to educate the providers out there so that they can in turn educate their patients. If you had the power to change the hospice benefit, how would you change it? I would, I would have it incorporate a true national palliative program. So the difference between hospice and palliative, okay, hospice is part of palliative care, but palliative care is for people who no longer want to seek aggressive curative treatment. They are choosing quality of life over quantity of life. We have palliative programs. Um, hospitals are doing a great job about integrating palliative programs. Here's the gap. The gap is, is that when somebody's in a palliative program, they're enrolled, even in the Medicare approved palliative programs, they have no option if something happens, they still have to go to the hospital. There's not a triage nurse along with a palliative program that's gonna send another nurse out to see that patient and keep them at home. They're gonna have to go to the hospital. And if anything arises, if a patient lives in a boarding care, in an assisted living or in a skilled nursing facility, it is the law that they have to go out unless they're on hospice. So if we get that to include a palliative program, you can imagine how many people we would save from going to the ER. And most of these people don't want to go. So I think that that is by far the thing that I would change. And Dr. April, you know, I do see that, because uh, I, I did start a palliative uh, program before a different company. And, and you know, a lot of people have that confusion. They say palliative versus hospice, when in reality, hospice is the most robust form of palliative care. And as you say, you know, the palliative programs that we have right now, there, there is still that gap. It's by payers, by insurance, what the insurance covers. It is amazingly complicated. So given that, um, that we said that, so how do you see the future of hospice? I think hospice is going to become much more mainstream. You know, I mean, we are at the beginnings of the silver tsunami to be sure. So. I think hospice will have no choice but to become more mainstream and I think this will really open our society up and we will better understand death and have a better relationship with it instead of fearing it so much. So I have a lot of hope for hospice. I think that people are going to finally start to understand it and are, we're going to see society getting more of a benefit from it. And especially with educators like yourself writing articles and giving education to the community, I think that it's very necessary that we reach out and we, and we teach not only the families, but we also teach the doctors and, and, and you know, I think like everybody. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, everyone. Really? You know, you, you fear what you don't know. And I think there's a lot of unknowns for people about hospice. That's right. And so continuing to have these conversations, it helps reduce that fear because knowledge is power. So I really take my hats off to you, Jose, for asking me to come here today and join you in this conversation. And I appreciate being part of such an important project. Well, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. And thank you very much.